Let's talk a little in this section and that section about some sort of elementary applications of what we've been doing. This section is population models. Is this 1.5? This is 2.1, I okay. want to say. So we've already looked at what could be a population model. It's very elementary, but dp dt equals k times p. This is the exponential growth population model, and it assumes that the growth of the population just depends entirely on the current population. So if one animal has twice the population as another group of animals, there's twice as much procreation, so they're growing at twice the rate. This tends to be realistic um, for sort of beginning um, animal populations when there's nothing to prevent the growth from happening. So like when invasive species enter a lake or something. This model tends to be realistic at least at the start. And We have, we've solved these already. Um, this is giving exponential population growth. So exponential population growth isn't sustainable. Exponential growth is really never sustainable anywhere, which is why I said this tends to be maybe realistic at the start and then becomes less realistic as time passes. This is a model all models have assumptions in them. The assumption of this model, the primary assumption, or at least a primary assumption, what am I writing? This k is the birth rate minus the death rate. And a major assumption of this model is that these are unchanging. The birth rate minus the death rate is perfectly constant. Suppose that we allowed instead the birth rate and the death rate to change with time. That would give us dp dt equals our birth rate function minus our death rate function times p. And everything here is a function of time. Um, we often just write to beta minus delta. Uh, count to this textbooks and count to this sort of people in general are not always as good as they could be about clearly indicating what's a variable and what's a function in their model. So you often see beta minus delta p and you sort of you sort of have to intuit 
Well, we're taking the derivative of p with respect to t, so even though we don't have function notation over here, p must be a function. So this is called the general population model. And there's no way to study the general population model as a single thing. It's too general. I mean, the way this is going to act if we assume that birth rates are constant versus the way it's going to act if we assume that the birth rate is sinusoidal with the season, I mean, that's going to give us completely different behavior. So, there's no way to study the general population model in general. What people do is look at specific special cases, where the birth rate is this, the death <coughs> rate is that, that sort of thing. The first example that I'm going to do with this model is not my favorite example. Um, examples like this are very artificial, but we'll get some practice with the math at least, and then we'll talk about what makes them artificial. So let's say that a fish population is hit with a disease, as a result of which the fish stop reproducing and the death rate is proportional to 1 over the square root of p. Um, initially, so when this disease hit, the population is 900 when, when will the fish go extinct? And that's that that's that time being, I don't know, time being years. So there's obviously a lot about this problem that's very artificial. Maybe we'll just start by acknowledging that. I mean, a disease that causes sick animals to no longer be able to reproduce, we can imagine. But in this problem, we're assuming that the entire species gets hit with this disease at once. It would be a lot more believable to suppose that a disease spreads through the population and that causes the birth rate to decrease over time. Um, likewise, the death rate being proportional to 1 over the square root of p, I mean that's believable up to a point, but it's also unlikely that a disease has a perfectly constant death rate. 
I mean, obviously trying to take stuff from, you know, the human realm and abstract it into the animal realm is a shaky proposition. We have medicine that animals don't. But certainly this has basically not been true for any disease that affects humans. Death rates vary over time as things like medical treatments advance. So it has some pretty shaky propos um, assumptions built into it. It's assuming that we can accurately count the fish population at the moment the disease hits. Um, in reality, by the time we know the disease, has hit, it's too late to go back and, and count how many fish there were. But, but just as, as an exercise in mathematics, if nothing else, we can approach problems like this. The birth rate here is being set equal to zero. The death rate is proportional to one over the square root of p. So the general population model turns into this. And then, let's see, yeah. And then this uh, simplifies in a natural way. It's um, DP dt equals negative k times p over the square root of p. And if you remember, p is p to the first, the square root of p is p to the one half. So we subtract the powers, p divided by the square root of p. is the square root of p. And this is separable. We can get the p's by themselves. We can get, I mean, there's only that dt, but we can get that dt by itself. One over the square root of p dp was negative k dt. And we can integrate both sides and say what you will about this problem being artificial, but at least uh, at least its artificiality makes the calculus easy. Let me remind us, 1 over the square root of p is p to the negative 1 half. So when we integrate this, let me do this, let me find the space on this whiteboard. p to the negative 1 half will bump up to positive 1 half, and we'll get a 2. Negative k will turn to negative kt plus c. Um, so, what's our goal? Our goal is to solve for the population. Um, I guess I just sort of jumped into the calculus without really addressing why I'm doing this. 
I mean, if our goal is to find extinction, extinction occurs when the population is zero. So my logic for doing all of this is that if I can find the population function, I can then set it equal to zero. So we divide both sides by two, a constant of integration divided by two is still an arbitrary constant of integration. Let's see. I interest. Do not, I uh, have this in my notebook. I think I must have copied it wrong because I do not think I have enough information to answer this question. But let me copy this onto the next frame and then let's talk about it. That. P equals negative KT over 2 plus C squared. And the piece of information I know is that at the start of all of this, the population is 900. So what does that tell us? Well, if we let t be zero, and we let p be 900, 900 equals C squared. So this is getting us solve for this constant of integration. The square root of 900 equals C, is that just 30? I think so, yeah. Yeah, this sounds right. This sounds like the kind of constant of integration we'd get in a textbook problem. So we can find our constant of integration if our goal is to set P to zero. Um, at some point, I mean, there's that k there. And that's why I said I think, and it's no longer I think, I definitely must have miscopied the information we are given doesn't suffice to find k. So let's go back and let's add some information. Let's say at the start of this outbreak, fish are dying at a rate of 70 per year. Some information 
And yeah, and I mean, now that I think about it, it's obvious. You're going to have to have some information about how fatal this disease is if you want to know how long it takes for the fish to become extinct. So that's, we can use this information early on. In fact, by the time we get here, it's too late to use that information, because the information we're given is about a derivative. It's what dpdt is initially, and by the time we get here, we've gotten rid of the derivative. Let's go to this frame. and do some work. dp dt equals negative k, the square root of p. And the way we're going to find this k seems a little unintuitive, maybe, just because of the way you're used to using data, right? I mean, but this, I think the way most people tend to look at something like this, they focus in on the word initially. So when time is zero, the derivative is this. And then we get here, and there isn't any time variable. And it's like, so where do we plug t equals? equals zero into this equation. Well, when t equals zero, we're given the derivative and we're given p. So t equals zero isn't going into that equation directly. What's going in there is that 900 and that 70. Or more accurately, because the fish are dying, negative 70. Negative 70 equals negative k times the square root of 900. So negative 70 equals negative 30k I always, I mean pretty much always in differential equations, we're going to be working with decimal approximation. It's very unusual to write seven thirds um, in an answer. So seventy divided by thirty, two point three repeating. There's our k. And now we can go back two point three repeating divided by two. is 1.16 repeating.
And now we can set p equal to zero. And hopefully solve this without issue. We can take the square root of both sides. The square root of zero is still zero. And we can subtract 30 from both sides. And finally, we can divide. Negative 30 divided by that. Uh, what did I do? I screwed that up. Okay, negative 30 divided by negative I mean, again, trying to think of this in real world terms, that's assuming that everyone just sort of sits around, which may or may not be accurate. I mean, if this is like a lake with a fishing resort on it, or there's some economic benefit to preventing the fish from going extinct, this certainly leaves people with plenty of time to try to intervene. But this is our prediction. Let's look at the logistic model now. This is more interesting to me. It's more, it's a real model, first of all. It has a name and everything. Um, it's also going to be we'll solve some differential equations, but the logistic model is going to be the first example we give of how we can maybe analyze differential equations without solving them. And the logistic model is artificial, just like every model is. But the logistic model asks the question, what if the birth rate is related to the current population? I mean, that makes sense. And the logistic model says, what if the birth rate is some value minus beta 1 times p of t. And this might seem like a very artificial, a very unnatural supposition. So we're assuming that the birth rate goes down as the population increases. And that's maybe the opposite of what we'd expect. It's certainly the opposite of sort of, well, hold on. This is the birth rate. So this isn't saying that the number of births goes down as the population increases. It's saying that the birth rate 
go with down. And you can imagine this in an animal population. If you think of an animal population that is grown bigger, then the environment can really sustain. There might be a lot of births just because there are a lot of animals, but because the animal population is unsustainably large, it's maybe not especially healthy. Individual animals can't eat as much as they need to, for example. So that's causing the birth rate to go down. So this is the guiding assumption of this model. And this is the basic assumption that as population increases, birth rate goes down. We see that across thousands of different species. I mean, in species as diverse as we see it in humans, we see it in fish, we see it in animals in completely different I forget the species, phyla, kingdom stuff, but we see it in a very wide selection of animals. Now this model is still artificial. So this model, whoever first invented this model, said, okay, I want the birth rate to go down as the population increases, what's the absolute easiest way I can do that? Linear. This model assumes we have this perfectly linear relationship. And certainly that's not realistic. But again, you have to balance on the one hand, realism. On the other hand, is the model good enough? I mean, there's no point in making your model super realistic and super hard to work with if this unrealistic approximation is giving us what we need. So, what happens to the to the um logistic model sorry what happens to the general population model we're going to make another assumption here And again, this is something where you could not make this assumption, and then you have a more complicated model. But we're going to assume that the death rate is constant here. So this general population model becomes dp dt equals the birth rate, which is linear decreasing with the population, minus the death rate times the population. And we are going to mess around with this a little. B0 minus delta 0 P minus beta 1 P squared. We're just rewriting this slightly. Um, P times beta 0 and P times delta 0 gives us that. P times negative beta 1 P gives us this. And we're going to make an assumption here. We're going to assume that beta zero 
minus delta zero is positive. And if that is true, we are going to call this the logistic model. And let's talk about this assumption, beta zero minus delta zero being positive. What does that mean? So beta zero is a birth rate. Beta zero is the initial birth rate. Um, again, the situation we have here, our birth rate is linear, it's decreasing. Beta zero is the y-intercept. Beta zero is the biggest the birth rate ever gets. Delta zero is the death rate. If beta zero minus delta zero were negative, the birth rate will always be less than the death. And there's not really much point in trying to analyze that mathematically. I can tell you what happens if the birth rate is always less than the death rate. The animal species goes extinct. So this inequality is the only case where this model is worth analyzing. And let me see, we, we rewrite this a little more. I mean, again, at this point, we're not doing differential equations. We're just messing around algebraically. We're going to pull out a beta 1p from this. When we pull out a beta 1p here, well, we can pull the p out fine. There isn't any beta 1. So we wind up with a beta 1 in the denominator of the fraction. And here is the logistic model rewritten a little. And finally, I mean, it's good to remember, I mean, it's good to remember what this is, but at the same time, it's an ugly looking fraction, and we're going to get real sick of writing that. It is just a constant. So that's Let's give this constant a name. We've got beta 1p. Let's call it k. Minus p. And this rewritten a little. is, again, the logistic model. We can solve this differential equation um, using separation of variables. It's going to be kind of messy to do it in generality. We'll do it with a specific, with a specific beta 1 and a specific k. We're not going to solve this. But this is an excellent opportunity. The textbook doesn't do this yet. But this is an excellent 
excellent opportunity to back up my claim that we can often get information from a differential equation without solving the differential equation. Let's ask ourselves what's going to happen to the population, to this animal population, as time passes. So the first thing we notice, or a thing we notice, is that the population is changing as time passes, but time is not explicitly showing up on the right-hand side of this equality. Um, that's because our assumption has the birth rate depending on the current population. So only population is showing up in this differential equation. What happens if the population is greater than k? So I created this line it's a population number line, and let's mark k on this number line. And let's ask what happens if the population is greater than k. So if we're over here, Beta 1 is a positive constant. The population is always positive. So that's positive. If the population is greater than k, then k minus p is negative. A positive number times a negative number is negative. The derivative is negative meaning that the population is decreasing. Let's see if I can. There. If the population is initially up here, greater than the k, then the population is shrinking as time passes. What if the population is less than k. So what if we're down here? Well, if the population is less than k, then the derivative is the product of two positive numbers, and the derivative is positive. Since the rate of change is positive, the population is increasing. So if we start less than k, then as time passes, our population grows. So from this picture, I don't know why I drew those arrows kind of weak. But if the population is less than k, we increase. If the population is greater than k, we decrease. No matter what the population is, we're going to wind up here, either because we start down here and increase, or because we start up here and decrease. So the prediction we are making is, when you think about it, the very natural prediction, it's that the population will reach some kind of equilibrium. I'm not using equilibrium in any kind of technical sense. I just mean that as time passes, the population approaches some number and stays.
is fair. And certainly that's what we see in a lot of real world situations. I mean, the deer population in Shadron, basically constant. They're not going extinct. They're not increasing so much that they completely overrun the town. They're pretty much staying as they are. I mean, occasionally we do call them, or maybe that only happened once, but they're pretty much constant. I mean, the fish population in a river, you could, the bass population, you can talk about, you know, seasonal changes, you know, their spawning season and the like. So sometimes the population grows, sometimes the population shrinks, but year to year, probably pretty much constant. So this model where the population goes to some number and then just stays there is not a bad model. In spite of its simplicity, in spite of the fact that we assumed for literally no reason that this function would be a linear, it is modeling what we see in a lot of real world situations. Granted, this is still an elementary model. I mean, it's a model we present in like the second week of an undergraduate differential equations course. But even with that simplicity, it doesn't seem to be a bad model. It's showing us what we expect to see. Uh, let's go ahead and solve this model. But again, there are sort of comments I want to make. So solve dp dt equals kp Two hundred minus p. Let's say this is the population of a country. I said KP. It did not seem to register on the board. Um, a population of a country, maybe measured in millions. T equals zero can represent 1980. And let's say in 1980, the population was 100 million growing at a rate of one million per year. And again, this is basically going to just be an exercise in calculus and an exercise in separation of variables. Um, because once you sort of leave the abstract and enter reality, this is allegedly a real country. Suddenly, I mean, suddenly this assumption we're making about the birth rate seems a lot less defensible. We're looking at a specific country, its birth rate almost certainly is not perfectly linear. So if we want to try to like predict their population in the future or whatever, I think this is probably a pretty unreliable way to do it. But 
as an exercise. Let's find the population function p of t. We can find that k right away. Um, we're given we're given a value of dp and a value of p, and when we take this p and this dp and plug those in, we'll be enabled to find k. 1 equals k times 100, remember population in millions, times 200 minus 100. So 1 equals 10,000 K. Uh, 200 minus 100 is 100. 100 times 100 is uh, 10,000. So, so 1 over 10,000 equals K. And my secret shame, secret no longer, is that I want to use decimals, and even though it's the easiest thing in the world, I can never convert those fractions to decimals in my head. So, 0 0.0001. Zero 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 So, dp dt equals 0 0.0001 times p times 200 minus p. This is separable. We can get the p's by themselves. This is, I mean, we're just dividing both sides by this. So this is the uh, the hardest calculus problem we're ever going to do in this class. It's it's not a I guess a huge deal if you can't do it off the top of your head, but this is a partial fraction decomposition. Uh, we've got that denominator fra factored, and I don't really expect that anyone remembers partial fraction decompositions well enough to, to do them off the top of your head when you're confronted with them unexpectedly. But a partial fraction decomposition, if you have that denominator factored, it says that we can rewrite this as a constant over the first factor plus a constant over the second factor. And the trick to finding those constants, the trick to finding A and the trick to finding B, was to take both sides of this fraction 
and multiply them by that denominator. And that gives us 1 equals 200 minus p times a plus p times b. Because like when we take a over p and we multiply by this, this p and this p cancel and we just have the 200 minus p left. When we take this term, b over 200 minus p, and we multiply it by this, the 200 minus p's cancel, and just the p remains. And then we select values of p that make terms disappear. p equals 200 turns this into zero. And we're just left with one equals 200 B. P equals zero. Well, it turns this to zero, it turns this to 200, and we have one equals 200 A. So A and B, they don't have to be the same, but in this particular problem, A and B are the same. They're 1 over 200. Questions before I erase this? must be a way to just select all this text and erase it, but I've never figured out what it is. So, one over 200 times one over P plus, 1 over 200 times 1 over 200 minus p. The point of the partial fraction decomposition is that we're going to be able to integrate both these terms equals, and over here we can just, we can just do this integration. Like so. Over here, again, sorry if you, if you hoped you were sort of done with, with all of this once you got out of calculus. Again, I promise this isn't isn't what all of this class is going to be. I think that after, after next week, we're probably never going to take another integral. But 1 over the natural log of the absolute value of p, we're doing a small u substitution. This negative sign here is turning into a negative sign there. And let's mess around with this a little. Let's multiply both sides by 200. On the left, multiplying by 200, I mean, we're just 
we're going to get rid of these terms. On the right, multiplying point zero 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 one by two hundred will give us point zero two. And at some point, I'm going to have to go to a new frame, but for now, let's stay here. And now we can get rid of both these absolute values. And this, by the way, this can shows you the advantage, even if you are planning to try to solve the thing, this shows you the advantage of trying to analyze differential equations first before you solve them. Because why can we get rid of these absolute values? Well, we can get rid of those absolute values because the population is always positive. That's, that's clear enough. But why can't the population be greater than 200 million? Well, because of the picture that we have here. The population starts beneath 200 million, and it's just going to grow up to 200 million. So the population is going to remain under 200 million, and 200 times P is always going to be positive. So we can get rid of all of our absolute value signs. This is a good time to turn to a new frame. We're really giving our, giving our prerequisites a workout here, because now we have to remember if we have one natural log minus another natural log, how do we simplify that? And the answer is that a natural log minus another natural log is the natural log of a quotient of the first term P divided by the second term, 200 minus p. And this equals 0 0.02t plus c. We could solve for C at this point if we wanted to. I mean, we know the population when T equals zero. Uh, let's just continue with the algebra. We can solve for C at the end. So continuing to give our prereq so work out to get rid of a natural log we want to take the exponential of both sides and we're going to write again more algebra we perhaps remember that if we have addition in an exponent, we 
we can write that as a product, like so. And we will now multiply our ultimate goal is to get p by itself. You've probably solved problems basically like this before. We'll multiply both sides by the denominator to bring p up. Then we'll bring the p over here back to the left via addition or subtraction. So multiply both sides by 200 minus p. So we multiply this by 200. And we multiply this by negative p. As I said, we would, we can now add that p over to the left. Good Lord, but we're almost done. Um, we pull a P out on the left. So this is how we're going to get P by itself. On the right, nothing is changing. And now we will get P by itself. We will divide both sides of this equality by that ugly thing on the left. There's probably also a way to copy and paste stuff if I could figure it out. But 200 e to the c e to the 0 0.02t divided by 1 plus okay and this is a way to write our answer. Um, you know how there are sometimes these sort of conventions like, oh, if you have 1 over the square root of 3, you should rewrite that so the radical is not in the denominator. There's kind of a convention that we should Get rid of all of this and leave the 200 by itself. And the way we do that is to divide top and bottom by 200. Well, not by 200, but by all of this. And this convention actually is, in my opinion, Probably going to leave us, did I miss a zero, by the way? Is it zero point, yep, zero point zero two. 
I think this convention genuinely might leave us with a nicer answer. Sometimes these conventions are pretty arbitrary. When we do this division, we just get 200 on top. And then in the bottom, this divided by this is 1 plus 1 over e to the c, e to the 0, 0 0.02 t. But now we're going to rewrite this more. 200 over 1 plus e to the negative c, e to the negative 0 0.02t. So this does have an advantage. I mean, that e to the c, that e to the 0.02t, that's an ugly looking expression. It showed up twice. Now the expression is only showing up once. So unlike the square root thing, which has always completely mystified me, there is some clear advantage to doing this. And we are out of time, but if you let t equal zero, P equal 100, then you will be able to make this even better. You'll be able to solve for C, and that E to the negative C will be replaced by whatever decimal. Let me take I know we're running out of time, but if you can bear with me just a second, I'm going just a minute over, let's see. Desmos isn't gonna like P, so Y equals 200 divided by one plus we didn't have time to solve for e to the negative c. Let me just put a number here times e to the negative 0.02x and zoom out. So here's what this graph looks like. If we look at this part of the graph over here, it looks exponential. So this is initially kind of exponential. It initially looks like the dp dt equals kp, but after this initial growth, growth slows, and you see what happens is that, just as I said we would, we keep growing towards this 200. This 200 is called the carrying capacity. And we haven't quite finished this section. I'll have to, I'll take a look at the homework and see whether you can do the homework or whether I'll have to put it off and I'll post an announcement on Canvas.